I'll be honest with you, I'm trying not to lift off because it's baptism Sunday. I'm trying to contain my bare feet on this ground so it's baptism Sunday. And it is a time of celebration, it is a time of excitement. And I want, before we jump into the book of Acts, we're going to be in chapter 8. If you want to go ahead and put your thumb there or look that up on your phone, you can go ahead. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 8. But before we do, I think there are also something else that we need to celebrate. Uh, I, I hope that you are aware that the Supreme Court ruled, uh, ruled down Roe versus Wade. Maybe you're happy about that? I thought it was... And I wanted to say something about it, and I thought, you know, it's, those time, it's one of those times I, you get a little self-conscious about it, and you think, well, I want to say the right things. I, I don't really want to say the wrong things. And then you come to that realization that there are probably people out there that are more intelligent and well-versed than you are. And so I'm going to use someone else's words to kind of articulate something to you as a faith family. And these words come from David Platt. And he is a pastor in Washington, D.C., surrounded by uh, the political, all of that stuff. I don't even know what it is, all that stuff. And um, you may know David Platt. We've, we've kind of partnered with David Platt for seven or eight years. He's the guy who leads Secret Church. But he put this about, um, in light of the ruling of our country yesterday, he said this. Let's praise. Praise God for the first time in almost 50 years in our country. It is no longer seen as a constitutional right for people to take the lives of children in their mother's wombs. Every good gift comes from God's hand, and this is, God, this is a good gift that God has given by His grace for His glory as the Creator who forms each of us fearfully and wonderfully in a mother's womb. So first we praise, and then we pray. Pray that in the days to come, abortion would not, not only be illegal across our nation of states, but unthinkable across our minds and hearts. We praise, we pray, and then we love. Love women with unwanted pregnancies who feel like abortion is their hope and who feel like they just lost hope, especially as they watch people, including Christians, celebrate this ruling. Love the dads involved in these pregnancies and love every person who views abortion differently than we do. I think that's a huge, huge statement for our faith family. We praise, we pray, we love, we commit. Commit our lives and families and the church families in a fresh way to care for those with unwanted pregnancies. Commit to serve them, honor them, work for their sake, and address all the reasons that led them to desire abortion. Commit to provide and support, commit to provide the support they need to care for their children, or when that is not possible, to provide for their children through foster care and adoption. Pray, praise, prayer, love, commit, and finally, proclaim. Proclaim that. Proclaim the hope that is found in Jesus alone, the creator who came to us as a baby in a mother's womb to love us, care for us, live for us, and die for us so that everyone who hopes in him across our nation and all nations might have abundant life for all eternity. Amen. Amen. Praise, pray, love, commit, and proclaim. Um, I call you to that as a faith family in regards to the Supreme Court's ruling and I know some of you live in Missouri, but we church in Illinois, and Illinois is a state where we've got to understand this is the starting blocks, not the finish line. So please commit to continue to pray for our state and our nation. I wanted to make sure I talk about that and celebrate that as we are at Baptism Sunday. Um, the, ta- the tank is over there. There's some warm water in there. Uh, I'm looking, looking forward to it. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Anybody movie? We can hang out right there. It is smoking the bandit. I know that, that kind of, yeah, I, I'm a bit, little bit of a redneck. So are you. So that's okay. So we're little people. Um, we are still in our story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is God creating heaven and earth to be unified under the rule of God and humans together. The entirety of the Old Testament is looking forward to the Messiah, pointing to the one who will pass the test, pointing to the one who will defeat death, the one, the king who will come. In this side of the cross, we know that to be Jesus Christ. We traveled through the book of John, and John tells us he wrote that book so we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. And then we started into the book of Acts, the story of Jesus passing the baton to his followers. And we see that the the theme of Acts is all that Jesus continues to do through his followers empowered, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Last week, 
we kind of turned a corner. We turned into the second section of Acts. We looked at a man by the name of Stephen. We saw his death, his murder as the beginning of the church spreading. His, his death led to a persecution and, and believers begin to scatter, right? We saw a beautiful example of, of Jesus as our judge and our defender. And this morning we get to look, last week we got to look at Stephen. This week we get to look at Philip and, and two men that he encounters. And the next week, Terry Henry is going to be here and he's going to get to introduce you to a man named Saul and that is going to be awesome. Let me just say, that's going to be awesome. That's one of my favorite parts of Acts. We get this morning, we get Philip and, and two people that he encounters. How, we're going to look at how those encounters are the same. We're going to look at how they're different. And we're going to briefly, I'm lying, we're not so briefly, but we're going to look uh, in a lengthy way at how, some confusing things that I think that are in all of, of chapter 8 together. And then we're going to dunk some folks. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll try and get through it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. Open your Bibles, open your journals, open your phone, or it's going to be on the screen behind me. Acts, cha Acts chapter 8. We're going to take it in two big chunks, and we're going to read the entirety of it. We're going to talk about it. So here we go. Let's look at the first encounter Philip has, verses 5 through 24. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon, who, was previously, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people in Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time, he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that, that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when he, they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord... They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Philip, if you recall, was one of those individuals the early church set aside with Stephen and, and some others to help in the new church. They needed some help getting some stuff done. And they were chosen not necessarily for their competency, but more for their character. Because I, I think it was really apropos, Brady mentioned a few weeks back, back, back character is king, not competency. Um, and in the scattering of Jesus' disciples. Stephen is murdered and persecution starts and the, and the, the disciples are all scattered and the, they come to Samaria. They're scattered to Samaria and they come and Philip was one of them and he comes proclaiming Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that the Old Testament scriptures pointed to. And we read, we read it's going well. Like all the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. Demons are being cast out. People that are paralyzed can walk and that are lame are healed. The text says there was much joy in the city. And then we get to meet Simon. And there's some things I, I want you to notice about this guy. He was a magician, a sorcerer of sorts. Simon referred to himself, that's a key, referred to himself as somebody great. He had the entire city following him wrapped around his finger because, they, because he amazed them with his magic. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, the text says. So it was everybody. 
Philip shows up, he preaches the gospel, people believe, meaning they, they switch from following Simon to following Jesus that Philip proclaimed. And I mean, Simon seems okay with this, like verse, 30, verse 13, even Simon himself believed. And after believing, being, and after being baptized, he com- continued with Philip. Like he's so okay with it that like he gets baptized and continues to follow Philip, assuming he's listening to him teach and Seems to be going okay. Real quick, you need to remember, I think it's important for us to remember where this is occurring. This is occurring in Samaria. Samaria is a place that some of the persecuted followers of Jesus had, had, had run off to. And Samaritans are a group of people descended from Jews that had intermarried with other tribes and other people. And to the Jewish people, that's a huge no-no. You don't do that. But the Samaritans, they had done that. Um, They had created almost a religion for themselves, just to put it bluntly, that the Jews saw as wrong. They intermarried with with tribes they shouldn't have. They formed a religion that's incorrect. They established a different center of worship. They kind of manipulated the first five books of the Old Testament for themselves. They rejected the writings of the prophets and and some of the religious um, traditions. To the Jews, a Samaritan was like almost more revolting than a Gentile. Samaritans were what one biblical scholar calls half-breeds who defiled the true Jewish religion. The apostles get word. There's some of them, the apostles, the original apostles, stayed in Jerusalem. So they hear the gospel went where? Samaria. And so they send a delegation to check things out. Listen, we're going to go check this out. And they send Peter and John. They send some big boys. Right? So you know this is serious. You know this means something. They clearly are not playing around. And here's where we're going to get into some of the muddy water that I think is important for us to kind of wallow in for a little while. But I appreciate your patience as we go through it. People have believed Philip's message that the Messiah has come. They believe the message that Jesus was the Messiah. They had decided to follow Jesus. They had been baptized. But The Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them, the text says. And this this probably hits us as strange. Like, isn't it when, you know, you begin to follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes to live within you? Isn't that the way it works? And I would say, yes, that's the way it works. So the question is, well, well, what's going on? That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked. Um, And we're going to spend a few minutes on it. Peter and John arrive, and they see that, yes, the movement of God has come to the Samaritans. They are believing. But then they begin to recognize that these new believers had not yet received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hadn't come to live in them. Now, I don't know how they knew that. The text doesn't tell us how they knew that, but they do. They're able to discern that. Luke says they, Peter and John, laid their hands on the Samaritan believers and they received the Holy Spirit. I think it's safe for us to assume that there must have been some sort of outward sign that after the laying on of hands, they received the Holy Spirit. And I say that because of what Simon says next. Simon, in the very next verse, after the laying on of hands and receiving the Holy Spirit, says this in verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. So there was something that Simon was able to see. Something indicated to Simon that the Holy Spirit had, had come upon these new Samaritans. And I think the question, it begs the question, well, why the delay? Why the delay between following Jesus and the whole, being filled with the Holy Spirit? I would suggest this is, this is not intended to be a typical paradigm for salvation. This is not indicating that somehow salvation comes in one stage and then a second stage. The belief of two stages of salvation is known as the doctrine of subsequence. In stage one, you're saved by grace through faith, and this is God's gift. It's not of our own doing. And then in stage two, at some later time, there's, you experience some sort of exper- spiritual blessing or an experience when later you receive the Holy Spirit, which some would say is indicated by an outward sign. Usually that sign is speaking in tongues. There are denominations still today, everywhere in our nation, that adhere to the doctrine of subsequence, the two stages of salvation. 
But here in our text, this text in particular, I don't think Luke intended for that to be a model of salvation. Because what he's describing here, what happened, it seems to me, it seems to be something that was unexpected. It seems to be something that wasn't the norm. Look back at the text. Luke writes, For he, the Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them. Words matter. Big words, little words. So that word for seems to indicate a break from the norm, a break from what they're expecting. In other words, Peter and John were expecting to show up in Samaria, see that these people had come to faith, and and, be, and already be filled with the Holy Spirit. But against their expectation, the Spirit, the Spirit had not yet come. It seems to have struck them as different than what is normally expected. We have other passages in the New Testament that help us with this, uh, this I think. Other passages in the New Testament that clearly seem to tie the reception of the gospel and belief tied closely with the reception at the same time with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 right in the middle of it. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Or even more clearly, I think in Romans 8, 9, about halfway through it, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That seems to me, to me, it seems pretty straightforward. So the delay here in Acts, Acts 8, between belief and being filled with the Holy Spirit seems to be exception, the, an exception and not the norm. And I think the reason, the reason for this is tied to what's happening here in church history, in the history of the church. This is the first time that the gospel is now heading outside of Judaism. It is heading outside of Jerusalem. It's advancing to a new people. You could almost say to a new people group, the Samaritans, who the Jews actually really despised and hated. One pastor put it this way, It would make sense that if these Samaritan converts are going to be received into the new covenant community, not as second-tier Christians, but as joint heirs in the grace of life, culturally speaking, there was going to need to be some type of evidence to the church that they had received the same gospel, the same spirit that the Jews themselves had received in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 2. I think that's very much why God in His wisdom why God delayed the coming of the Spirit here in Acts 8. Why the delay of the Samaritans receiving the Holy Spirit? So the apostles, Peter and John, could witness His coming so they could see that the Samaritans didn't didn't receive a second-class spirit because they were seen as second-class people. God delayed it so Peter and John could see that it's the same Spirit that they received in Acts 2. That's the first bit of muddy water that we're going to walk to. But I want to go back to Simon the magician, the self-proclaimed somebody great. Simon sees this. He sees the laying on the hands and the, the Holy Spirit comes and he's like, hey now, <laughs> I, 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 can I get, on, get in on some of that? Right? Hey, I'll give you, you fellas some cash if you te- me, teach, me, teach me that trick. I'll, I'll pay for that power. Simon made several mistakes here. Uh, I think the biggest one was who he said this to. Uh, That's Peter. And if you know anything about Peter, Pete's going to have a response. And that response is going to be quick, fast, and to the point, and usually just right at somebody. That's why I like Peter. Verse 20, he said this. But Peter said to him, to the magician, Simon, may your silver perish with you. So just, yeah, hope you die. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot of this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Good old Peter, right? I think Simon's response to Peter's rebuke, I think it's very interesting. Simon's like, well, I don't want that to happen. Like, that sounds bad. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want that. I, I don't want my money to die. I don't want to die. That sounds bad. You should pray for me. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good answer. It's a pretty good answer. I think he's doing pretty well. Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And here's where I think he goes a little wonky. If you look at the entirety of what we learn about Simon, I, Simon believes and, and he wants prayer, but 
you know, he also wants some, some power here. He wants some influence. His prayers are like, well, just make sure bad stuff doesn't happen to me. Simon's heart was not right with God. Simon, somehow, in his belief, faith had not penetrated his heart yet. I want to look at our second encounter, our second encounter that Philip has. It's going to be in verses 25 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Some say Gaza. I'm going to say Gaza. I don't know. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come down to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. This is from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, beginning with this scripture, he told him about the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, the, through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I love this story. I, I, this story, it's one of those stories, it's so straightforward, it's so right at you, but it's just wild with action, right? Philip, he's, he's like, hey, go to the desert, okay, oh, hey, there's a chariot, yeah, run it down, like, oh, okay, I'm going to go run after it, he hops in, and this guy's reading from Isaiah 53, and he takes him from Isaiah 53 to Jesus, they get out, they baptize, and boom, Philip's gone. That's pretty cool. Like, it's just, it's just, I I mean, he dunks the guy and disappears. Josh, like, if you disappear when you, when you baptize your kid, like, how cool is that going to be? Right? That's what I'm hoping for. All right. (laughs) Oh, I love you, brother. I love you. Okay. There are so many things that we could look at in this encounter. I mean, I think this is rich with application. There are so many things that we could look at. We could read, we've read story after story of large groups of people coming to follow Jesus. And here we get this intimate encounter of one-on-one evangelism, right? We could say, listen, always be ready with the gospel. Philip hears the good news to go to, hears from God to go down to, to Gaza. God said, go and When God speaks, you better act, right? We could talk about being obedient to God's call and obedient to his voice. The Ethiopian man, he's reading Isaiah. New Testament's not even written yet, right? We could say the the entire Bible, all of it it points to Jesus Christ. It's always about him. We could talk about God and his sovereignty, working through two men to take the gospel to Ethiopia, the ends of the earth. There's just so many things, right? And all of them good, good. All of them are good, but I'm going to take us through some mud to get to the one point that I think is important for us as a faith family in these verses. Um, If you have an ESV translation of the Bible, which is what our our journals are, uh, if you have an ESV translation, you might notice that the text goes from verse 36 to verse 38. Like, what happened to verse 37? Like, that's a good question. You guys are great with questions. Some of you may remember, we we ran into this a little bit in Matthew, and it's not that uncommon. There are 15 to 16 instances 
where in the New Testament, the ESV and some other translations of the Bible seem to skip verses. And, and so what's up with that? And I want to take us down that rabbit trail because I think it's important for Baptism Sunday. Here at LifePoint, we hope to use the most accurate, precise translation of the Bible. And at this moment, we believe that ESV is that. When something is added to the text later, the ESV is not going to include it. So ESV translation goes to the original manuscripts and translates it into our English, the ESV Bible. Acts chapter 8, verse 37, did not occur in the earliest manuscripts that we have found, that we have. Verse 37 didn't appear until about 500 A.D. And the passage was apparently added by a scribe who wanted to explain why the Ethiopian was baptized. Really smart people are involved in this science or or art, you may call it, and it's called textual criticism, and they study this at great lengths. Well, I'm just going to give you my humble opinion that when these scribes add text later that's not in our ESV version, I do not think that the truth that God is presenting is affected. So this, to me, isn't something to get kind of too riled up about. But today, if we look at the verse that the scribe added in verse 87, that he added in A.D. 500, it does give us some insight. It gives us some insight of how the early church preached the gospel. It gives us some insight to how the early church talked about baptism. And I think it's super helpful. So why don't we look at that verse? So I'm going to read verse 36, then verse 37 that was added later, and 38 together. Here we go. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and baptized him. The early church, I think what we can learn from that is the early church saw the importance of the heart. Believe with all your heart. There's not just a head knowledge, there's a heart transformation. And what did the early church say should be believed? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Ethiopian believes with all his heart, his heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Thus, nothing prevents him from being baptized. Like I said, there's so much good that we can encounter in, in these verses. There's, there's so many directions, but I want to end by pointing out just one thing on Baptism Sunday from these texts. In the Old Testament, there was a law, a special law that related to eunuchs. A law that barred them from entering the Lord's temple. They were regarded as kind of a symbol of inadequacy. inadequacy. They were a symbol of brokenness. They represented inadequacy and broken, not fit to be in God's temple and not fit to be in God's presence. And now here's this Ethiopian eunuch. He's heard the gospel. And Philip, who understands the real significance of the gospel, says, "In in essence, hey, Ethiopian man, the old temple that that you're not allowed in the old temple that you're not that you don't belong in God has raised up a new temple in Jesus Christ an Ethiopian eunuch you are welcome to full membership in the temple of Jesus Christ the Ethiopian asks see here is water what prevents me from being baptized in the original language that it literally says what hinders me from being baptized the significant thing about, about that question, what hinders me, is it's, we're going to encounter that verb in a couple of weeks. When Peter has this vision, it's this sheet, and he, he goes to the Gentiles, and it's like, what hinders the Gentiles? It's going to be the same verb that we're going to encounter in a couple of weeks. But even more significant, I think, it is the last word in the entire book of the book of Acts. Paul gets to Rome, and he preaches the gospel, and here's the last verse of the last chapter last two verses of the last chapter of Acts. Acts 28, 30 through 31. And he, Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. 
Hindrance, hinder, same word. Same word. I believe that Luke is saying to us, barriers are broken down and nothing is going to hinder God bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the very ends of the earth. Not a government, not a political party. Nothing will hinder God from bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And those hindrances that like man puts up, we put up all these hindrances, they're broken down by Jesus. No matter your cultural background, no matter your country, no matter your color, the mess you are, the mess you were, what others say about you, no no matter what corner of the earth that you came from, nothing hinders you from following Jesus Christ. Simon the magician, he hears the gospel But his heart, it just wasn't right before God. He simply wanted some power and some prayers of protection. Simon focuses upon hearing the good news of Jesus and and was a continued belief that he, Simon, was great. A pursuit of things for him and, and his benefit. And then there's the Ethiopian man and his reaction. I always blow past the Ethiopian man's reaction because I'm just so enamored that Philip just disappears. It says, and he went on his way rejoicing. He had just come from Jerusalem to celebrate at the temple that he wasn't allowed in. He just came from Jerusalem. He wasn't allowed to go into that temple. And here he encounters the salvation, a new temple found in Jesus Christ. And he goes away rejoicing, rejoicing in the good news, rejoicing that God loved him so much that he sent his son Jesus. For him, the Ethiopian eunuch, God called him just as he was, broken, defiled, foreign to many, different. But because of Jesus Christ, there was no hindrance between Jesus and the Ethiopian man. He believed with all his heart that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I love that story. I love to think of Philip running after him, hopping up in there. Let me tell you about Jesus. Water, boom, dunk, poof, gone. But I also picture the chariot driving away and the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot who just left the temple that he wasn't allowed in. And now he's been reconciled, reconciled to a holy God. I kind of, I kind of put it in there and I, I I don't, I don't know, but I, I imagine he's riding off in the chariot and he's singing Charlotte Elliott's great hymn from 1835, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting, fightings and fears within and without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come and here at life point, just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome and pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe. O Lamb of God, I come. I wonder how that hits you this morning. I wonder how that hits you this morning. Have you encountered man-made or even self-made hindrances to Jesus? What hinders you from believing? What hinders from you you from giving your life to Christ here this morning and saying with all your heart that Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God? God's able to break down, friends. God's able to break down those barriers, bringing you to faith in Jesus Christ so that you might, like this Ethiopian, say, what hinders me from belonging to Him? What hinders me from confessing that I trust in Him? What hinders me from being brought into the family of God? And friends, hear this. Nothing hinders you this morning. You see, Christ has done everything that's necessary. Everything that's necessary to break down the barrier between you and God, bringing you into His presence. 
And he did that upon the cross. He did that upon the cross. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 say this. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Our sin hinders us from being in the presence of a holy God, but that sin has been forgiven, that debt has been paid, and it has been nailed to the cross because of Jesus. Because of his sacrifice, because of the cross, nothing hinders you from coming to him today.